This week in the South Carolina State House, Senators approved the $8 billion state budget. House lawmakers approved an open constitutional carry gun bill. Lawmakers in both houses sent the pension reform bill to Governor McMaster's desk. And there are 12 legislative days left in session now that crossover day has come and gone. Debate was contentious in the House Wednesday over a bill that would allow people to openly carry guns without a permit or education. The bill passed a Republican-controlled House, but not after Democrats derided the rushed route the bill took. I hope that in the future, that as we move forward, that the majority party will have some consideration to know that the minority party is here to have a voice that you all may not always want to hear from. But we were all elected by the same amount of people. And to invoke cloture, shame on you and shame on this leadership for allowing that to happen. The bill's sponsor, Mike Pitts, and other Republicans said the bill truly upholds the Second Amendment. By definition of the Constitution, the Second Amendment right held up by two Supreme Court decisions gives you the ability to keep and bear arms without being permitted by the government. Bear, keep in mind, this is not a privilege like your driver's license granted by the bureaucracy of the state. It is a right guaranteed in your Bill of Rights in the Constitution of the United States. The bill moved so quickly that no testing was even given for or against it, and it quickly went through the committee process to hit the floor before crossover. Many Republicans didn't want to vote for it, but felt compelled to do so for their beliefs. And ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about protecting constitutional rights, when we talk about respecting each other's rights, we begin with the First Amendment, and that's the right to free speech. And in this body, that is the most important thing that we have to represent the people that send us here. And when we tell the folks that don't have enough votes to pass a bill or to defeat a bill, that we're going to cut off the debate, that we're going to cut off their right to speak, then we're telling them that the 35 to 38,000 people that they represent, that they are irrelevant. The open carry bill quickly became a lightning rod after House members rejected a move by Representative Jonathan Hill to pull his open carry bill from committee to the House floor. In order to offset that negative vote for his bill, a bill by Representative Mike Pitts was quickly introduced and pushed through committee and then to the House floor to compensate for the negative action. Even Republican Representative Mike Ryle pulled the current back on what House leadership is banking on, the Senate stopping the bill. And um, as I walked around today and talked to everybody, I keep hearing, well, I'm going to vote for it, but I, you know, I don't like this piece of it, but I'm going to vote for it. I wish this wasn't in there, but I'm going to vote for it. Maybe when it goes across the Senate, they'll take care of this and we don't have to deal with it. Really, folks? Is that why you were sent here? Early in the day, Wednesday, House lawmakers gave final approval to the $150 million pension reform bill after it made its way out of what's called a conference committee, with both House lawmakers and Senate lawmakers resolving differences between their two versions of the bill. The Senate also adopted that bill later Wednesday evening as well. The bill now heads to Governor Henrik Master, where it's presumed he will sign the bill that will help fix the roughly $20 billion pension shortfall. So do you view this as solving the problem, or are we going to be back here dealing with this? No, this no. It's, it's, uh, I think we've solved the problem on this or as close as we could. We're going to monitor it uh, as, the investments as the investments come in. See, got them on my side. Right, right, right. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. Right, listen, <laughs> so. I'm not sure that that helps the statement or not. I mean, no, it does. It helps the state, but we can also go into a defined contribution plan if it warrants that between now and the, and the uh, time that we hit the 85%. Well, we, we made no commitment to, to change the plan. No, we made we made a commitment. We made a commitment to have a part B on this to hear all the sides of it and to let the uh, Few Foundation and the um, Reason Foundation uh, come in with their numbers to see if it, it if it indeed does make sense to do it. The Senate continued debating the eight billion dollar state budget on Thursday, which is crossover day, and sent it back to the House with their changes. The Senate also took up several other bills on crossover day as well. 
One was a Good Samaritan bill, where if someone uh, calls 911, even though they have, may have committed a crime themselves and they're with someone that's overdosing, they call 911, they are not prosecuted for any criminal offenses. Uh, that bill did receive third reading today in the Senate. It's going over to the House and it will be considered by the House this year, which is encouraging. Thursday was crossover day in the State House, and that means if bills were not passed by either chamber by this date, which is a month away from the end of session, their likelihood of becoming a law is greatly diminished. Bills still can make it over to the other chamber and can still make it into law if they have not passed either chamber at this point. However, it's a more difficult process for that to happen. Any bills not approved by either chamber or not even sent to the governor at the end of session, which is May 11th, still can be carried over to next year and next legislative session, which begins in January. Several bills passed by the House on Thursday and this past week included several focused on the growing opioid problem in the state. Representative Phyllis Henderson, who's part of a bipartisan group pushing these bills, spoke to us about what bills were going through and it, why this is such an important process. That was clearly demonstrated to me yesterday when we had a vote on the mandatory prescription drug monitoring bill. No, no debate, no discussion, no questions, overwhelming, you know, um, unanimous vote. Um, it's clear to me that people realize it's a problem and they're willing to, you know, put reasonable things in place to help fight, fight prescription drug abuse in South Carolina. Earlier in the week, House Democrats and Republicans alike were frazzled by a letter from Governor Henry McMaster who said he would veto a gas tax increase and suggested that instead a $500 million bond bill for deferred state needs be doubled and applied to fixing state roads instead. The amount is close to what the state needs annually, but for two decades to get roads into good condition, according to an SCDOT report. It drew heavy criticism from Democrats who said McMaster was playing politics with the Rhodes Bill. Well, now, we wouldn't want to necessarily uh, ascribe, subscribe uh, a motive to the governor's actions, but I don't think it's a coincidence that he will be up for election next year. Uh, but we've had enough politics when it comes to roads. What we need now, uh, it's for men and women who are here, we need us to People need us to do our jobs. Just pass the bill, make a start, and get some things done. That's what the voters are looking for. Republican House Leader Gary Simrel said he met with the governor on Tuesday when that letter came out and said the governor is not playing politics with the roads bill, but is seeking input in a good way forward to work with lawmakers on how best to address the roads. I think the governor truly wants a solution. Uh, I, he is looking in within his wheelhouse and what he sees is the best move forward for South Carolina understanding that this is a process. It is the legislature working with the executive branch to come up with a solution. I welcome the solution that, that he has and we will work through it as a general assembly. McMaster later held an event Tuesday at the governor's mansion for Darlington Raceway, the state's only NASCAR track. Driver Dale Earnhardt Jr. was on hand to talk about the upcoming Labor Day race. Governor McMaster addressed the letter he sent to House lawmakers afterwards with reporters. I've have studied this question, I've analyzed it, and I'm, my, I'm confident that there is a better way. I have spoken to a number of senators and House members from the very beginning telling them this is where we were going, but we've gotten to the point now where it's, uh, uh, I was uh, hoping that everyone had gotten the message, but apparently I think everyone has now. There were no new developments in the ongoing State House corruption investigation this week. McMaster's two candidates for the State Ports Authority Board moved forward and were approved by the Senate Transportation Committee. They were delayed after news reports tied their businesses to the political consultant group Richard Quinn and Associates, which has been involved in the ongoing corruption investigation. And we reviewed the testimony and found that it was consistent with what the record was and that the relationships with um, Richard Quinn and Associates was, was several layers removed. So these individuals did not have any direct ties to Richard Quinn and Associates. And children advocates were on hand here in the State House Tuesday to continue to bring attention to the ongoing problem of child abuse, child exploitation, and human trafficking. South Carolina Department of Social Services Director Susan Alford was on hand along with Attorney General Alan Wilson who said they need to continue fighting against this growing problem in the state. Last year, the South Carolina Department of Social Services processed more than 53,000 intake decisions that resulted in 18,398 children that were the subject of founded investigations of child maltreatment in the state. As the director of the South Carolina Department of Social Services, I can tell you that these numbers are sobering and daunting. But we have to remember that statistics are more than numbers. Every intake decision is a decision that affects a child. 
and the journey that that child takes into adulthood. Child abuse and neglect affects every one of our communities. Here in South Carolina, there were 50 charges of human trafficking in persons closed in South Carolina courts. Of those 50 charges, 36 of those cases involved child minors, victims. Next week, the House and the Senate are on spring recess and will return back into session here in Columbia on April 18th. After that, there will only be 12 legislative days left in the session, and any bills that are not sent to Governor McMaster by that time will be carried over to the next session, which begins in January. For SETV, this is Gavin Jackson in the State House, Columbia.